I've been a financial advisor now for over 20 years, and, and these are the only four skills that you need in order to be able to retire with a million dollars. And the first one is good decision making, not just with your investments, but with all aspects of your life. And good decision making really starts with, you know, what are the important decisions? What are the ones that are going to move the needle? Where do you really need to spend your time and which ones are not that important? Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, calls them one-way door decisions and two-way door decisions. And and two-way door decisions, you can change your mind. You can go back on. But one-way door decisions are, are decisions that you can't change your mind on. So think, first being able to identify which is which and then be able to slow down and to take the time and to do the research needed to make a good decision. And oftentimes, it's not going to be just your information. You're going to benefit from having other people help you out when you're making some of these difficult decisions. So let me give you an example. With your investment portfolio, again, I've been doing this for a long time. With your investment portfolio, 80% of your success is going to come from one decision. And that one decision is your asset allocation. What percent of your portfolio is going to be in stocks and what percent of your portfolio is going to be in bonds? You know, Finding, finding the next Tesla, finding the next Facebook, you may find that. Most of us are never going to find that, right? Most of us shouldn't try to be finding that. We should be basically trying to, to beat inflation and to get good returns over time. But your asset allocation is really the main driver for your investment success. It's about 80% of your investment success. The next thing is, what's your goal? What are you trying to achieve? And I'd I bet if we asked 100 people, what are you trying to achieve with your stocks? You know, what's your minimum goal? What's the least amount that you would be satisfied with? You know what? At least 90 people, probably 99 people out of 100 are going to say, I want to beat the S&P 500, right? I mean, it's just, it's just out there in the media. Here's what I think the answer should be. I want to meet my financial goals, and I want to take as little risk as possible on the path to meeting my financial goals. Think about what is the S&P 500, which is just the 500 largest companies by market capitalization, what they're worth. You know, What does the return of those 500 companies have to do with, with your financial goals? So I just use these as examples, the good decision making and identifying one-way door and two-way door decisions. Let me give an example of a, of a two-way door decision. Uh, an example of that is, you know, should you buy a bond from, from company A or a bond from company B or even stock A or stock B if it's a diverse, well-diversified portfolio and it's a couple percent? Really, that, that is going to pale in comparison to what your asset allocation is. And what you want to do and I think this is the first step in good decision-making, is give yourself a choice amongst good alternatives. That's really a key where you've got a choice. Let's use the example of the bond portfolio of three bonds from three different companies. You know, they're, all three of them are great companies. All three of them are doing well. Maybe one pays a little bit higher than another one. But essentially, there is no bad decision. That's where you want to put yourself. We can't always do that. Life is complicated, um, but that's the situation you want to put yourself in. You know, you're, maybe you're thinking you want to buy a rental property, and should I, I buy this property down the street or the other property on the other end of the street? You know, you're probably going to do fine with both, and there are things that are, un, are, are just unknowable. We can't know them ahead of time. For instance, when you're picking a money manager, you know, people are very focused on what the financial returns are of a money manager. They want the next Warren Buffett. What's your investment performance been? And yes, that's important. But, you know, the truth is it's probably a point of parity. If, if you're looking at uh, a well-established firm that has a, a discipline that they've, they've used for decades and they've executed on for decades and they've done well, just because one money manager has done a little bit better uh, than another money manager for the last three years, the last five years, you know, really what you want to know is the unknowable. 
And that is who's going to do better in the next three years, in the next five years, in the next 10 years. Um, and you can't know that. So how do you choose? Let's say you're talking to a financial advisor and one financial advisor has slightly better performance than the other one. But you know what? You vibe better with the team of the one that has a little bit less performance. And it just seems like, you know what, they get me and the type of services that they're going to be providing for me. I, I just, it seems like they understand what it's going to take for me to get to where I, I need to go. You know, in that case, I, I personally think the better decision is to to neutralize the difference, to make that a point of parity between the money managers and choose based on the firm that you vibe with the best, the firm that's going to, you think is going to provide you the best level of service, the firm that has the level of expertise in other areas that you think are important. Okay. So the first skill that you need is, is, is good decision making. The next, the next skill that you need is dealing with uncertainty. You know, the reality is the stock market is an uncertain place. Ups and downs of the stock market and unfortunately 10% drops, 10, 20% drops. are That's certainly a, a feature of the stock market. It's not a bug. And, and why does that happen? You know, why does the stock market drop 20% uh, so quickly? How can that happen? And, and really what the stock market is, is the, it's a, a forecasting machine. People are trying to forecast the future. And, and so if we think this, uh, the economy is doing well and everything's honky-dory, and all of a sudden there becomes some storm clouds on the horizon. We don't have any storm clouds on the horizon today, I don't think. But uh, everybody's looking into the future and trying to forecast small changes today and what that might mean in the, in the future. For instance, with AI, artificial intelligence, you know, what does that mean? And there's some industries that it's going to be an incredible tailwind. You know, if the people, companies that employ very well-educated, highly skilled employees that can benefit from AI, boy, I think those employees are going to be able to do more than, than they could before. I remember uh, when computers first came out in a company I was at, you know, there were five of us that had to share one computer when they first came out, and we had to uh, put all of our information on floppy disk at the end. And you know, now we all have a computer at a desk, and I think we've all seen just how much how much more productive a computer makes. So, being able to deal with uncertainty, those ups and downs in the market, being able to deal with the uncertainty of it might take years for decisions that you make to to play out. Dealing with the uncertainty of what's your health going to be in the future? You know, when when do you decide to retire? That's a huge question, and it has a lot of uncertainty. And unfortunately, my industry has, has basically punted this question and said, we are not going to deal with uncertainty. We're going to use this tool called Monte Carlo simulation, which is a statistical method. It's a good method, but and it's where the 4% rule comes from. You may have heard of that. But, you know, the problem I have with it, my undergrads in engineering, is we run that and say, you know, we want our clients, obviously, to have as high of a likelihood of never running out of money in their lifetime. And so many times advisors want their clients to have a 95% likelihood, a 97% likelihood of never running out of money. I think that's super high. And... I think a lot of folks would be willing to say, you know what, I have an 80%. There's so much in life that's uncertain, and there's so much that's uncertain. Mr. Financial Advisor, in your plan, you don't know what tax rates are going to be next year. You don't know what inflation is going to be next year. You don't know what my health is going to be next year. And, And so we place all of this importance. Why do we do that? Because we're uncomfortable with uncertainty. You know, when, when you run a scenario, maybe somebody comes in and says, you know, I want to be able to retire and I've got $600,000. Can I do it? And you say, you know, in 20% of the cases, you're going you're gonna to run out of money. Well, what they don't tell you is in over half of the cases, you're probably going to die with more money than what you started with. You have to look at the analysis. This is not financial advice, but I want you to, I want this to be on your radar screen. So we're going to talk about financial advisors later, but if you're, ever work with a financial advisor, you know about this. And, you know, just being comfortable with uncertainty. 
uncertainty and optimism. To be successful as an investor, it does take some optimism. You have to believe in a better tomorrow. But tomorrow, certainly, where companies continue to strive to do things better, faster, and cheaper. And if they can succeed at doing that, they become more valuable. Okay, so the second skill is is dealing with uncertainty um, and, and the anxiety that comes with when a market downturn happens. And that's, I'm going to, before I move on to number three, I want to share another thought with uncertainty. And that is the, the thing that hurts most people the most and derails them. They could be on plan for years, for decades. And then they get derailed when they become a forced seller in a down market. That's a really important thing I want you to remember is really do everything you can to to never put yourself in a situation where you could be a forced seller in a down market. I shouldn't say never. There are times where it, it might make sense for you to do it, but the, the, if you're wrong and you do become a forced seller, it can be really painful, uh, full disclosure. So how do people become forced sellers in a down market? Really two ways. One is they use leverage, they use debt, they have the bank calls a loan and they don't have the cash to pay it, so they have to sell stocks. That's probably not what's going to happen to most of my viewers. Here's, here's what's more likely a risk to most of my viewers, and that is the market's down 20%, 30%, 40%. And if you think I'm being dramatic... In the uh, financial crisis, 2008, 2009, the market, the S&P 500, top to bottom was down almost 60%. And, and, and what caused people to sell, they didn't have to sell. They didn't need to sell in order to, to pay their living expenses next year. It's the anguish and the anxiety of watching your account go down that much. And, and people saying, I just can't take the pain anymore. And oftentimes what happens is people hold off. They're like, I don't want to become a forced seller. I don't, I don't want to let my emotions control me. And they hold off and they hold off. And finally they acquiesce and they say, I can't take it anymore. And, and guess what? That, that tends to be when the last people do that, the way you see that, that's, that's typically when you're starting to put in the bottom. And the way you see that in the marketplace is you start... You see additional really scary headlines, but you know what? The stock market just stays flat or it starts to go up. And what that means is all the people that we're going to sell have sold. And the rest of us are holding on and we're like, you know what? We're long-term investors. We know the ride's going to be painful, but we're, we're holding on. Uh, and so that's the sign when you see that. But unfortunately, those people that sell, they almost made it through it, but then they acquiesced at the last moment. So I don't want that to be you which is why skill number two is um, being comfortable and being able to deal with uncertainty. Okay, the third one. I said the first one was probably the most important. If that was the most important, this one's the second most important. And that skill is the skill of trust. And, you know, if you want to retire with a million dollars, most of us are going to have to trust advisors. We're going to have we're not going to do it on our own. We're going to need good advice along the way. Certainly in the tax realm of things, right? For most of us, our taxes, we don't think about this, but for most of us, our taxes are our second or third largest expense in our life. And, you know, we're, we're doing our tax planning ourselves, which is nuts. You know, a good accountant is not crazy expensive. So trusting in an accountant, uh, Trusting with an attorney to, to set things up the right way, particularly if you're a business owner, uh, getting things set up the right way the first time. Too many of us are trying to save nickels and dimes, and yes, it's thousands of dollars, I know, but relatively small dollars for the impact of the types of decisions that are being made. You want to have the very best information. You want to have the very best advice so you can set things up. And I would argue same thing. None of what I'm saying here is financial advice. Instead of listening to me, you should get with a financial advisor that's a fiduciary to you 100% of the time. Somebody that knows your situation and can give you good advice. Those are the three main river guides that I think people need. And it takes trust. It takes trust and, and a willingness to, to, to spend the money. Personally, I think I get a very good return like in the order of five, ten times what I what I pay the, the advisors that I have on my team. 
that advise me when I'm doing things like this. So uh, having trust and actually using advisors. And then the, the final skill is the skill of balance. Balancing out current, and this, this is an important one, all four of these, obviously, these are the four skills. Uh, balancing out current you and future you making the right amount of sacrifice today so that you're set for the future, but not giving up your life along the way, right? Life is meant to be lived and enjoyed in a, in a, a place like this. Here, you have, I'll give you the view behind me. And you don't, you don't want to say, well, I'm going to start living when I'm 65 when I retire because you know what? You're, you're not going to have the same energy you have today. You're, you're not going to be the same person that you are today. I've talked earlier in my channel that I used to do a lot of hang gliding, and it was a lot of fun. It was a great adventure, but, you know, I'm a different person today. I'm not willing to take that risk now to go hang gliding. Even when I have the time, even now, now I can afford the best equipment, uh, but I'm a different person than I was when I was 17 and 18 and was learning to hang glide and did that really for 20 years until I had kids uh, and really, you know, enjoyed the heck out of it, but... Not only do we lose our energy, but we lose part of who we are. We become different people. So there's these moments in time. So balancing out current you and future you. So those are the four main skills. And then, as I said, it's also important to enjoy the journey. And that's what this video up here is. Seven things that I want you to stop doing in your 50s in order to enjoy whatever time we have between now and when we retire. I'll see you in that video. Thanks for watching this one. Bye-bye.